Welcome to TN Inspire at TLCC 2016. I'm Matt Hodge, and I do come from the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, but my big disclaimer before I begin is that all thoughts that I'm going to present, or perhaps croak for the next five minutes, are my own and not necessarily those of my employer. And that's because my topic tonight is a wild theory about the future of classical music. Now, the future is somewhat of a scary place for the classical music world. In the next 10 to 15 years, a large number of our current core audience will have died of old age. So the big job at the moment is audience growth. And what we normally mean by that is sending marketing out to find people who like classical music and trying to persuade them to come along to our concerts. The problem is that pool of people might be shrinking as well. So today, I want to flip the idea. What if instead we went to people who don't like classical music and tried to persuade them to come along? But then the question becomes, how do you make people like classical music? In fact, why do people like one type of music and not another anyway, right? Now, this is a painfully under-researched question, especially when it comes to classical music. But recent findings on the brain and music have highlighted three factors that impact on your musical taste that are really useful for us to know about in the classical music world. Factor number one is pattern matching. Quite simply, your brain wants to know where a piece of music is going in order to enjoy it. So studies by Ohio University found that audiences hate Schoenberg's music because their brains can't keep track of it. It just sounds too random. My question is, though, what if that's happening to ordinary people <laughs> listening to Beethoven? What if those newbies sitting in the stall thinking, when is this going to end? What if that's their brains not able to keep up with the pattern of a 45-minute piece of music? Factor number two is personal connection. Other studies have found, not unsurprisingly, that we have a higher preference for music that we know lots of other people like as well. It is a type of peer pressure, but I think it's about how we connect. See, if I feel connected to you, I'm more inclined to like the music that you like. So, for instance, when conductors speak from stage, we know that audiences respond better to the music, and I think it's because of that personal connection. But it also highlights the problem, doesn't it? See, for many people out there, they have almost no personal connection with classical music or classical music people. We're not actively working on building a personal connection with them, is it any wonder that they don't like our music? Factor number three is purpose. We're increasingly understanding that why you listen to music will impact on the type of music you listen to. Are you listening for fun, for intellectual stimulation, for relaxation? There are lots of reasons that we listen to music, but for the typical non-classical person out there, they could be forgiven for thinking that the only reason for classical concerts is serious music listening. Certainly doesn't look like what a fun or entertaining experience looks like anywhere else, right? Wasn't always like this. In the 19th century, concerts featured a mixture of serious and light music thrown together, so events became multi-purpose, playing for people who wanted serious and light music all on the same occasion. That's part of why classical music took off. So, what if we did things differently today? What if, instead of making all our events around the whims of the uh, artist who's flown in for the week, we made some of our experiences around making people like classical music? Now, there are plenty of ideas we could borrow for this. For pattern matching, look at Toronto Symphony with its visual concert guides that show the listeners the pattern of the music. Or Philadelphia Orchestra with its Live Note app that gives you a running commentary on the music in real time while you're listening. For personal connection, what if we trained our musicians to host a concert and work a crowd like Renee Fleming or Audra McDonald or even that nemesis of orchestras everywhere, Andre Ryu? What if we made our brochure copy more arty and less friendly? What if we had big multi-purpose 19th century style events that threw in jazz, classical, popular and film music all in the one concert to reach as broad an audience as possible? Now, these are just ideas. They could be wrong, but ideas can be tested and measured with data. And data is something we're pretty good at here at TLCC, right? If we're brave enough to experiment, we could find out which things actually do make people like classical music more. And finally, let's think huge here. If 10 or 20 or 30 organisations here banded together to collectively crack the nut of making people like classical music, I think in a decade we could have a global network of organisations keeping this music alive. That's my wild theory anyway. <laughs>